welcome back to Sextras. Where we talk about sex and all the extras. I'm honey and I get sick a lot. (laughs) (laughs) You really do. But hello guys, I'm Maria and I actually didn't have a fun fact but our guest today inspired me with his fun fact from my fun fact and my fun fact is that I can do this thing, this noise that not a lot of people can do and they think they can do it but they can't but okay I'll do it. And like most people (laughs) just go like but I can do like I like I can do it really loud but sorry for your ears wow good job (laughs) that's my cool trick that I can do with my mouth but yeah great (laughs) okay well we have a very exciting guest joining us today his name is Sir Ezra and he is a BDSM coach a professional dom and he is the headmaster of the House of Algos in LA and we're going to talk to him all about BDSM and the importance of BDSM education. So please welcome Sir Ezra. Hi. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for joining (laughs) us. Do you have a fun fact you can tell our audience? Yeah, absolutely. So it's going to be hard for people to to appreciate this over audio only, but I can cross one eye at a time. (laughs) So I'm going to come in close to the camera here and just move one eye in at a time. (laughs) And I could do that. I I was like five when I figured that out. So I'm sure it was very strange. Yeah, that's so cool. (laughs) Yeah, it's so cool. Yeah, it's a good party trick. (laughs) okay well we thought we'd start with a little segment today where we asked our listeners what the craziest kink someone they've slept with has ever had so we can just kind of talk through them you can tell us if you've experienced them yourself or like we can just kind of discuss our thoughts on them so Maria do you want to start us off with the first one yeah, someone mentioned a massage orgasm. Nice. Is this something that you're like familiar with at all? I guess it's not really that related to BDSM in my guess, but I could be wrong. Well, not necessarily. Yeah, there's um, so there's yoni massage, which is a specific to uh, massaging the vagina. But there are also ways of achieving orgasm through other parts of the body right Mm. the orgasm is something we experience in the mind before the body which is why we can you know uh come in our sleep right so i I have heard of it and that's a a very special person who can come from a if it's a massage from the body that's that's quite exceptional but uh really it's just a matter of the mind yeah Mm. for sure i mean i wish i could come in my sleep and come for a massage that'd be great (laughs) i can never come in my sleep i'm like too dominant so as soon as my dream starts to get sexy i like insert my conscious mind into it and then wake up oh wow quite frustrating interesting that's that's a good level of control yeah that's what i was gonna say (laughs) Uh, excuse me better control would be to like butt out and just let it happen (laughs) you just just like experience it (laughs) yeah okay well the next one is tentacle hentai tentacle hentai is really uh, really popular and i would even sort of say it extends beyond hentai into into porn so you could say tentacle porn maybe it maybe encapsulates all of it and this comes from the uh, it definitely comes from japan it comes from sea creatures and and octopuses and squids sort of representing female sexuality and also from what i understand it also has a connection to the the element of water being a representation of femininity so mm. i think that's interesting and i think there are a lot of reasons why the japanese are kinky and we could probably fill the whole show <laughs> with that so i'm just gonna leave it leave it at that there's a myriad of reasons but it definitely is something that you know the world has experienced in part if not entirely because of japan yeah yeah i feel like i've never really heard of like tentacle porn until that was more like sex education on the internet so it makes sense that that would be the reason i guess yeah a good a good if you're interested in tentacle porn uh 
the best way to ethically live out your fantasy is to go to Bad Dragon and get a tentacle dildo. Oh my god, I've seen those. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's better than molesting wow. animals. Yeah, definitely. Okay, someone else mentioned exhibitionism. Okay, exhibition is very popular. Exhibition is really interesting. So it, it almost like touches on humiliation. Like there's, there's a lot of erotic humiliation. And I think that one of the essential components of that is being seen, right? It's almost, it's impossible to be, you know, humiliated in a vacuum. If you trip in a really embarrassing way and nobody sees it, you're like, oh, wow, that could have been embarrassing, right? Mm. And so I think, you know, there is, there's a couple different things. There is like the, you know, erotic humiliation of we're doing this thing that should be private in public or, you know, or somebody's observing it. But there's also like a compersion or like vanity. So there's, I think there's a bunch of different reasons why, you know, exhibitionism is popular, but it's very popular, especially in the BDSM community, because we end up with these sort of opportunities to expose our kinks and to be seen doing our thing, right? So yeah. They tend to concentrate in the, in the community. I like the description that you said about the like tripping and it it could be embarrassing like I think that sums it up really well I feel like anyone who I guess hasn't experienced someone who's into exhibitionism or aren't into exhibitionism themselves I like that the next one is Shivari is that how you say it I don't know if that's how you say it I'm sorry <laughs> yeah sh so Shibari is like Japanese rope bondage okay and uh, there are a lot of different kinds of bondage, and to me, bondage really speaks to the eroticism of power, right? So, you know, one way to describe power is the ability to do something, mm -hmm. right? And if you are tied down, you can't do shit, <laughs> right? And so, like, I, for me, power exchange is an essential component of sex. And so rope is a fantastic mechanism of power exchange because we can, you basically giving your partner permission to restrict your power. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that like, sorry, this is kind of going into the main part of the episode, but do you think that power play is kind of, or not even power play, just power dynamics are a kind of fundamental part of sex outside of bdsm in general uh well you're asking you're asking me which is you're gonna get the answer is yes <laughs> uh you know for for me personally uh -huh. if if there isn't power exchange it isn't interesting it's like it's like um you know it's a mm -hmm. burger without any condiment like okay i'll still <laughs> eat it but i'm not gonna enjoy it as much you know yeah <laughs> Yeah, that's fair. Well, and I think, I think that there's always power involved in sex. So even if we're not consciously engaged in power exchange or uh, mindfully engaged, there's always still power. There is the power to withhold. There's the power over. There's the, you know, any forced sex situation is, is mostly about power, right? Mm -hmm. Um. And so I think every sexual experience ever had a power dynamic, whether that was spoken or unspoken or conscious or unconscious. Uh, and I think that when we consciously acknowledge the power situation, we make the situation safer and we make the situation, in my opinion, more erotic because there's no mystery. There's no question. You know, two people often sleep together and they don't know if they're going to... One person says, this is great, I'm never going to see them again. And the other person says, this is great, I finally found my person. You know? Mm -hmm. And when that's not spoken, that's terrible. That's a heartbreak. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when it's spoken, I think that there's so much more potential. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. That's kind of why I asked, because I definitely agree with the... I think there's always power involved, but... I, I that's kind of the answer that I wanted from you is that <laughs> it's better to reframe it in terms of 
like just actually acknowledging that there's power there rather than it being this unspoken thing that then causes all of these issues uh, like unspoken issues outside of that so i would definitely agree um okay the next one someone wrote i was talking to this guy on hinge and he said he wanted his dog to lick my nipples i blocked him after he said that though weird as fuck yeah so that definitely falls out of my realm of authority because you know, I'm a BDSM educator, and BDSM is something that happens between consenting adults. Consenting adult humans. You know, you really can't get informed consent from a dog. Uh, so, your bestiality yeah. is illegal, and it's one of those things that, you know, there's very few things that are completely off limits in BDSM. And the things that are illegal and unethical are excluded. Mm. And I, I would say that, you know, having an interest in animals in a sexual way doesn't make you a bad person, but acting on those things does because you have agency over that animal. That animal doesn't have a choice in that situation. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really important to clarify that as well because... You know, clearly this has happened to someone on Hinge, but mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of people on the internet that would maybe be willing to kind of take advantage of people's like unawareness of the fact that bestiality is illegal and kind of, you know, coerce them into doing something that they might just like laugh off. But actually, as you said, it is illegal, so... Well, and, and people aside, the dog was coerced. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, the dogs, even if you sort of try to make the argument that the dog has agreed to do this, the dog's survival is at stake, you know, and there's not a lot more sinister coercion than making somebody feel like if they don't do something, then their, their life is in danger. Mm -hmm. So it's a dog. Why would you do that to a dog? Yeah. Well, and, if, and again, you're not a bad person for having a specific fetish. You know, and, and there yeah. are ways to do it ethically. You can role play yeah. being a dog or you can imagine that the dog is doing that. But as soon as you involve an animal or a child or somebody who doesn't have their mental faculties, those are going to be, you know, illegal and unethical. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> okay. The next one is I had a guy who was obsessed with biting me, not hickeys, bite marks all over me. Biting is very popular. So uh, I don't know if you ladies are familiar with the Kinsey report. Yeah. Yeah. So the Kinsey report stated that 50% of people bite during sex. Oh, wow. Really? Interesting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm quite surprised. <laughs> yeah. Well, and to me, to me, that really illustrated how many people are kinky. Yeah. Right. I think that if you if you could paint the picture that com about sex that it completely excluded any kink at all, it's going to be the minority. It's going to be the, the vast minority of people who don't do any spanking or don't hold anybody down ever or don't do any biting, you know. Right. Yeah. Those are all I mean, there's between a kink and a fetish. Right. And so a fetish I would describe as something that you need to have a sexually fulfilling experience. Okay. So if you, for example, are like, you know, I like getting choked, but I'm sort of take it or leave it, right? Then it's a kink. Then you've got a choking kink. But it's not a choking fetish unless you're like, I'm not going to come unless your hands are on my neck. Oh, okay. I didn't realize yeah. that. Okay, okay. It's valuable to make that distinction too because... I think a lot of people have kinks and don't have any fetishes. And they're like, you know what, I could just, I, you know, they're all great, but I could just leave them all and I'd be fine. But for other people, that's not the case. You know, for other people, it is absolutely essential for them to have a fulfilling sexual experience. And that's why it's a political issue, because there are people who are, you know, interested in denying people what is an essential component of their sexuality. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. I never really thought of it in that as like a political issue, which is kind of stupid because <laughs> it it clearly is. I think everything to do with sex is and pleasure and whatever people want to do is is a political issue. Mm. So, <laughs> unfortunately, yeah. The next one is 
Halfway having sex, they asked me to smell my shoes because it gets them off. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, foot fetishism is not that uncommon. And the issue here is what we would call like mid scene negotiation. And that's really not okay. Mm -hmm. So, in BDSM, we really take care to acknowledge the impact of altered states. So, for example, you might be okay with that, right? You might be okay with, you know, hey, whatever gets you off, it's not going to get, it's not going to be in my, in my way, or you might not be, right? But your ability to make that choice is impacted by your arousal, right? And so it is unethical to negotiate whilst your person is in the middle of a really hot and heavy situation, unless you've got consent ahead of time. Hmm. You know, if you could, you could be having sex with that person or before you do, they say, hey, you know, I really want to smell your socks. And then you could say, well, ask me in the middle of it. Now that's ethical, right? Because you're not taking advantage of that person. Mm. But if you wait until the person is, you know, in the middle of an erotic experience, if you wait until that person is extremely sleepy, if you wait until that person is inebriated and try to get consent at that point, you're really just taking advantage. Mm. But foot fetishism is really popular. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely one that I see and hear about a lot. Yeah. And I think people think it's a lot rarer than it actually is. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm not interested in feet, but I am a sadist. And so I will pay attention to somebody's feet if they feel uh, like a strong aversion to that. And it makes them really uncomfortable because I, I'm not... I'm not aroused by somebody's feet, but I am aroused by somebody's discomfort. Mm -hmm. And feet can often be a short path to their discomfort. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, and the last one is rubbing vagina on knees. That one's new for me. <laughs> you know, I've heard of people making snail trails and stuff, but uh, yeah. never specifically on the knees. Never heard that. Yeah, it's quite a... Yeah, I was trying actually. to like kind of picture how that would work. <laughs> <laughs> like you sit on them or I guess I don't know so I, I'm just I'm just imagining like very strange like it rubs the vulva on the knee if it wants to play with me <laughs> <laughs> like that's how you initiate sex <laughs> yeah just go straight for Silence of the Lambs references because that's what the ladies like <laughs> getting kneed on the vagina like that's how uh, you know it's gonna yeah, start it, it could go very <laughs> wrong very quickly. <laughs> okay. So, let's kind of start with how did you get into your career? How did you figure out it was something you were interested in is there like a specific moment that you can remember that you just firstly decided you were interested in your personal life and then mm. when you wanted to pursue that as a career it's a it's been a long road um <laughs> i'm 35 now and uh i really i started the business last year so oh, okay and it was a gradual in that you know, I got more and more involved because I was really passionate about my community and about the people in it. There is a tendency for some of us, once we find our kinky community, that we just become completely disinterested in any other kind of community because it's like, it's just our family. You know, I'm automatically accepted. Yeah. And the, there's so much different, para there's such a different paradigm in terms of like we talk about everything and things are not assumed and i'm you know i'm non i'm neurodivergent and i don't like subtlety is not my strong suit and so the fact that we can just talk about everything outright and i'm not obligated to sort of pick up somebody's subtle cues which were just never going to happen in the first place uh is great so but <laughs> yeah. origin story so i was always kinky i was always really really into exploring you know, sexuality has been a journey that started very early for me. Let's just say when I was little, I played a lot of doctor. <laughs> so 
Um, so there was, I mean, I can go back to like age four where, you know, it was always exploring bodies as often as we could. Mm. And I was always doing the exploring. And when it came to sex, you know, when it came to being an adult or, you know, almost an adult, I naturally gravitated towards what we describe as either owner property or master slave relationships, where I would, I would gravitate towards women who would say, I'll do anything for you. Okay. You know, mm. like that was the most attractive thing a woman could say is I'll do anything for you. And I, w- I don't want to say like subjugation of the will because we're not really, we're not removing somebody's will. But when somebody can put their will aside for the benefit of their partner, I find it to be extremely erotic. Yeah, so that I sort of already found my power play orientation like really early on, like I was 16 or so oh, okay. um, when I first had a relationship, which in my current, with my current knowledge, I would describe as a BDSM relationship. And I somehow I would always find, you know, masochistic girlfriends. I don't even understand how I found them, but I did. <laughs> and it meant a lot of time alone, you know, because that's not super popular. I would say maybe being a sexual sadist or a sexual masochist is probably like 10% as popular as being gay. So, mm. you know, it's, they're few and far between. You know, I, I think people, people actually fall on the sadist or masochistic spectrum far more often than that, far more often than that. But, but in terms of people who are like, this is part of my sexuality, then it's, it's actually quite, quite small. Um, but at a certain point in my 20s, I decided that these types of activities were not going to be productive for my development as a, as a healthy individual. You know, I, I had this impression that these relationships were unhealthy or that I was going to be a bad person because of the things that I was encouraged to do. And really, that's the saddest misconception in my life yeah, because I wasted... I don't want to say I wasted 10 years because I have a beautiful, a beautiful child out of the whole thing, but I married somebody who was just not interested in that side of me. And I said to myself, you know, it's just not that important. It's more important that I ha- get a house, uh, have a good job, you know, have a, have a kid, get married, you know, all those things. So you could say that I was closeted, mm. you know, at a certain point, I, I, I lied to myself about how important that was to me. And after, you know, six years with that partner, I realized how important it was to me. And at first we explored together. At first we, you know, entered the BDSM community as a couple. And I would, I would call us uh, play poly. So we would maybe play with other people, but we, we didn't have any sexual relationships with any other people. But, you know, at a certain point, she was not interested in exploring anymore, and I was just getting started. Mm. So we divorced because of that, really. And um, I think maybe there were some other compatibility issues, but the thing that really drove it was, like, I found my people, and they really weren't her people. Mm. So that motivated me to really be in the community as often as I could, and I spent uh, maybe two years doing like two parties a month or three parties a month, or even sometimes on rare occasion, like two parties in a weekend. Uh, and I'm very lucky to be in Southern California where that's, that's a regular occurrence. You know, we're spoiled on a, on a good, on a good Saturday night pre COVID, I would have mm-hmm. three parties to choose from. <laughs> yeah. And some people have to wait one for one party oh once a God. month or, <laughs> or one party every six months even, you know. Um, so so I know I'm, I'm very lucky that way. And I'm service-oriented. So, you know, service is my primary love language. And so the way that I show my community love is by finding ways to be in service to the community. So I would volunteer whenever that was available. And it were sporadic things, like people would be hosting a party and they needed help, or there would be some you know, fundraiser event, and they needed volunteers. And eventually, I saw an opportunity to do, to volunteer regularly. And so my first job, if you will, in the scene was as a dungeon monitor. 
and the dungeon monitor's job is to basically make sure everybody's having a good time, everybody's aware of the rules of the party, nobody's messed up on drugs, nobody's making other people feel uncomfortable intentionally. And that was good fun, and I was doing that twice a month for a while. And then I realized that there was things that I was doing in my professional life that could translate to BDSM. Uh, I was doing, like, I was organizing education and hosting seminars in my professional life. And so I realized that that's something that BDSM could, could benefit from. You know, there's a lot of people who like to teach, but there weren't a lot of, at least where my home dungeon, Sanctuary LEX, there was nobody who was responsible for recruiting educators. It was just kind of like if you knew about it and you had the, the go-get to, to actually approach the, the organization, then yeah, you could teach, no problem, right? But there was nobody actively recruiting. So I took that role on. So that's, um, so that's how I became the director of education at Sanctuary LEX. Uh, and that was a little bit more than a year ago now. I think I took that job in November of 2019. And then COVID came and I lost my main job, which honestly I despised. So <laughs> it was really a relief. And I said, well, what do I, what do I have to offer? What can I do with the skills that I've acquired to help people? And so that's where coaching came from. And coaching is a way that I can basically be a short-term mentor for people. So BDSM has enjoyed mentorship as a method of education, as a method of development of community leaders. However, and I, I won't say that mentorship is obsolete. That's certainly not the case. Mentorship is really essential for the development of leadership in our community. And uh, unfortunately, though, there is far fewer elders than there are neophytes. So when you have 10, 20, 100 times more new people than you have experienced people, then there's a huge education gap. Mm. And if everybody who joins the community says, I need a mentor, it's just not going to happen. There's not enough people to mentor everybody. And so coaching is great because. You know, I'll, I'll say too that the mentorship is a relationship. Yeah. Mentorship is, is uh, like the, the idea that you would ask somebody that you're not a personal friend with to be a mentor is kind of amazing to me because you're asking that person to guide your life. So how are you going to just hand that over to a stranger, right? Mm. And so coaching <laughs> yeah. kind of bridges the gap too. So those that would get a mentor... Uh, I can be a starting point for them. So if you were like, I want to be in this community today, right? Uh, and you're starting from ground zero, then a coach is a great way to help you get oriented, help you connect with your local community. If you don't have a local community, they can support you in helping generate a local community. And it's also great for people who want to be professionals. You know, I think... There are a lot of people who say, oh, this is great, it's glamorous, and it's easy. It looks easy, and it really isn't easy. Uh, it's a lot of hard work, and the money comes fast when it comes, but it's not always coming, and it's not going to come if you don't know how to make yourself available and develop your character and develop your skills and things like that. And so that's what, that's what drew me into coaching and education. So with Sanctuary LAX, we're doing... 24 classes a year, and then I host, in my personal house, we host another 24 classes a year. And then my partner does support groups and book club and movie night. So, I mean, all in all, we'll, we're probably doing more than, we're probably doing 100 events a year. Oh, wow. Wow. You know, all in all. And what's that looked like during COVID? Has it moved online or? Yeah, things i don't know how things are yeah no it's people. terrible <laughs> um <laughs> terrible uh and it's yeah it's all online which i mean in some ways it's been a boon uh when i was hosting classes in person five people was a typical class attendance 50 was fantastic but would happen maybe twice a year and yep. then mm. after 
we went online, 50 people in a classroom is a regular occurrence. It's not every day, oh, wow. but we likely, we, you, I would say we average 25 people. Oh, wow. That's great. So you mm -hmm. don't have to leave the house, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, easier, to, it's easier to show up. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. And does it, not to linger on this too much, but does it kind of facilitate the learning? More, like, do you think it's easier to teach online or? No. No, no, it's not. Uh, a lot. Of, there's a lot of educators that are quality educators who have just said, "No, I'm not going to jump over. I'm just taking it, taking an L for the year." Mm. But I think it's made it easier for the student to learn, yeah. right? Because y y you ladies can attend any class in the world, right? It used to be you'd have to be you'd have to rely on your local community's prevalence of classes, mm. and that's no longer the case. You know, you can be in the middle of nowhere where no classes ever come and you can still go to the best classes in the world. Yeah. 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 Good. Well, one benefit yeah. of COVID then, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So we've kind of covered your job and I guess what, the main thing we want to know is what, what do people want to know most often when they come to your classes? What's the num or like the top three, I can imagine there's quite a lot. So the top three things that people are looking to learn. Okay, top three. So number one is definitely how do I find a partner? Okay. I hear how do I find a dom way more, but I believe it's because the submissives tend to be more willing to learn. So the doms don't show up for classes as much, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> because they need it. They need it more than the subs do. Yeah. You could be a fair submissive with. Uh, excellent communication skills and excellent self knowledge. Yep. Those two things, and uh, you can be you can be a fair submissive, or at least to start. And to be a dominant, you need uh, you need those things. But then you also need to be able to lead a scene. You need to be able to use the implements that you choose to use in the scene. So and so the list for doms is like almost mm -hmm. endless, right? You know, and it's useful for submissives to know those same things, but it's maybe not essential. And they're definitely not being judged based on how they can throw a flogger uh, if they're submissive, right? So how to find a dom is the number one question I get. Number two and three are going to be what kind of dom am I, right? Or what kind of sub am I, which speaks to that self-knowledge, right? And there are lots of different labels of types of DOMs and types of subs. And they are useful, but they're also limited, mm. right? So, I mean, I would call myself a service dominant because oftentimes I seek to, you know, to take care of my partner and to say, well, how can I, what can I do to serve you today, right? But if, I, if you just call me a service dominant, then you're missing mm. out on a lot of who I am, right? I also identify as a sadist, you know? And so I look at when I interact with a masochist, I'm doing them a service, mm -hmm. right? They, they have a need and I'm filling the need and I take pleasure in filling that need. Yeah, but there's like service doms, there's sadistic doms, there's daddy doms, there's mommy doms, there's handlers, there's owners, there's masters, there's tops. You know, so that's the D side and then the, the S side, there is, and I'm, these are all going to be incomplete lists, by the way, right? There's service <laughs> subs, there's bratty subs, there's slave subs, there's property subs, there's, you know, pet subs, there's bottoms that aren't subs, there's, and the, the list goes on, mm -hmm. you know. And so I think that can be really overwhelming for people. So what, how do I describe myself is maybe the best way to reduce the question to its core yeah and then the third one is probably a tie for different specific hard skills or maybe how do i negotiate maybe is the is the number three question because that's a skill that we're not really taught in our culture and then when you come to bdsm it's expected that we all know how to negotiate and that's it's huge and it's really it's the most transferable skill to regular everyday life because you are you know saddled with a million opportunities 
to negotiate, you know, negotiate for specific boundaries in a relationship or, you know, more money for a new position for, for whatever. They're all, every time you talk to somebody and you discuss an exchange of any kind, that's, it's a negotiation. Hmm. Yeah, that's something I find so so interesting about the BDSM world and like the kink community or whatever is that they, it's really, there's so much emphasis on talking about so many things and like everything is so clear and I don't get why like mainstream people or vanilla people or just like everyone gets accustomed to talking everything through so much. So I think like that's such a interesting and like amazing thing that is like why isn't it everywhere kind i've of got thing. an answer for you i mean if you want to if you want to know i have a theory go yeah. on oh yeah definitely tell us your theory <laughs> it, it's two things uh one is is very vulnerable mm -hmm. situation to be discussing what you want and what you need right and people are generally not willing to be vulnerable when there isn't a clear reward. Mm -hmm. um, and potentially part of that also is the second answer. And it's power. If you know what I'm looking for, then it removes a whole bunch of power if you are confused. Right? If you think I want a relationship and I know I just want to fuck you, right? Then I have power over you. I see. Mm -hmm. Right? So you might fuck me because you think that, you know, you're going to keep mm. me, right? But I say, well, I, I don't want a relationship. I just wanted to fuck tonight. If I have that conversation with you, then I don't have power over you anymore. Mm, yeah. Yeah. We call, that, we call that an asymmetric mind fuck when I have information that you don't and I'm using it to manipulate <laughs> you. Oh, well, yeah. Uh, well, speaking of mind fuck, like that's the title of your book. So do you want to... That's Talk right. A little bit about what that term means, and there we go. Get... There it is. <laughs> so, yeah, the title, the title of my book is "Mind Fucking Mindfully: A Guide to Mental Manipulation for BDSM and Sadomasochism." Okay. And you know, there are a lot of things that people do naturally to manipulate each other emotionally. And these are mindfucks, and when we do it in a way that is consensual, when we do it in a way that is erotic, and we, when we do it in a way that's ethical, then this is BDSM mindfucking. I think it's, it's, it's so natural in human nature that we all have done it, right? So if you've ever said to your partner, boy, you're going to get it when you get home, or I've got a surprise for you, Right, and you don't tell them what it is, then you're manipulating them to you're you're causing them to be you, you're causing them to be inspired to think of all the things that you could possibly do, right? And it can be very erotic. And I when I say manipulate, I don't necessarily mean negative, right? Like if I take your hand and I move your hand, mm -hmm. I am manipulating you physically, right? So moving somebody's hand isn't mm -hmm. unethical by itself. Yeah. The question is, you know, what are you doing and how do you have permission and things like that? And so, too, with, with mental manipulation, with emotional manipulation, uh, it isn't by itself unethical. It is very often used in unethical ways. And we explore it in the book because if you are going to want to do this activity, you really need to know the difference of what is ethical and what is not ethical, what is consensual, what is not consensual. Uh, if you're going to be able to sort of stay within that container of ethical and erotic consensual mindfucking. So can, can you get a little bit into that? Like, sorry, I don't know if it's like too big of an explanation. Actually, maybe you don't want to give too much away so people read. No, I'm, I mean, I'm happy, to, I'm happy <laughs> to talk about it. So um, what I've done is I've given like a, I've talked about specific types of mindfucking. So sort of dissecting the different uh, categories of that. So I think we touched on the asymmetric mindfuck. Um, there's also uh, perceived power mindfuck. If I tell you I'm psychic, then you may feel vulnerable, right? That I'm reading your mind and like mm -hmm. pulling out your deepest, dirtiest desires, right? There's asymmetric mindfuck, power, perceived power mindfuck. There's humiliation mindfucks. There's degrading or ennobling mindfucks where you 
like uh, mess with somebody's sense of station, right? And there's others too. I'm not great at remembering everything off the top of my head, but, uh, but we go through all those sort of things. We also give a wide number of experiences that people have had personally. So we give people a chance to hear what does it look like in real life, right? Because it's not, we're not talking about some hypothetical. We're talking about a real thing, yeah. right? And uh, a practice that people actually do around the world, right? And so we're sharing a cultural phenomenon, right? So we get to hear really hot and interesting stories of people mind fucking. And then we also are going to explore like how is it that our governments mind fuck us in unethical ways, in non-consensual ways? How do, how do corporations do it so that we're aware of those things and we don't accidentally do them and we can also minimize the effect that they have on us in our daily lives so that we have more energy to do those things with our partner. Wow, that sounds so interesting. I love the perspective of the government mind fucking and kind of intertwining that with the manipulation and yeah it sounds really interesting could you tell us a bit about why it's why you think it's so important to educate on bdsm not just for the people that are already in the community but for wider society as well like what benefits do you think it can have sure so some would debate that people outside of the community don't need to know about the community and I disagree. Mm. I, would, I would not say that's true because prejudice comes from a place of ignorance. Yeah. And when we have understanding, we have compassion, mm. right? So that, I think it's essential that we educate the general public about BDSM because it is going to bring greater compassion and we're not going to have to fight so hard to live lives. Then when we talk about education within the community, it's essential because BDSM can look like abuse. And it is not abuse. BDSM is anti-abuse. So just like in my book, where we talk about the ways that this can go wrong, we talk about the ways that many people do it in unethical ways, it's essential that we become experts at identifying abuse so that we can remove that from our community. It's like uh, tending to a garden. You may say to yourself, I only need to know what carrots look like if I'm only going to grow carrots, right? But you also need to know what weeds look like. And you also need to know what fungus looks like and, and insects and gnats and, you know, pests and such, right? Because you need to rid that. You need to rid your garden of that if you're going to grow carrots. And so if we're going we're gonna to have hot sexy consensual play and and you know fulfilling and and benevolent dynamics then we need to know what that looks like but we also need to know what the antithesis looks like so that we can remove it from our from our community and we can fix it and it's it's not always you know removing people sometimes it's identifying behaviors that are unhealthy and educating those people so they can be they can be productive members of the community mm, i think like, I'm so grateful that you're here talking to us about it because I think there are so many people, especially in our generation, that maybe have misconceptions about BDSM either because of they've seen porn or they've seen... There's so many inputs that kind of spread these messages and misconceptions about BDSM and yeah as you said it can look like abuse and it can get misconstrued and then misapplied when we don't speak about it in the ways that you're aiming to speak about it in the book and in your classes so yeah I think you summed it up perfectly that <laughs> it's just it's important not just for BDSM but as it is for anything to do with sex is that if we don't speak about it and if we don't spread awareness about the ways that it can go wrong and the ways that people can misuse their power and misuse their positions then we're never gonna make any progress and no one's no one's gonna be able to even acknowledge that something's going wrong in the first place mm -hmm. yeah 
well, and let me let me sort of spell it out too, uh, because I think it's, it's a really very important message. So let's just imagine that uh, you really liked spanking. You really liked being spanked. So the world is a wide place. There's a lot of different ways to get that, right? So let's say you have your partner and you decide, okay, well, I'm just going to make them so mad that they hit, mm. right? And this does happen. You know, I'm not saying that this happens all the time. I'm not victim blaming. But what can happen is somebody can seek out, you know, what is a physical punishment. They can seek that out because they find pleasure in it, right? And you're, that's a non-consensual manipulation of the, of the dominating partner. So it also is really flirting with danger because you're inviting domestic violence, right? Mm. And so maybe the spanking is great, but then when they punch you square in the face, you're not so happy, right? And what BDSM does is it says, look, having this impulse of wanting to be spanked is not bad. And there are ways to do it that are healthy, that are really that are productive. So if you now, the alternative is this person identifies that they mm -hmm. want to be spanked and they go, hey, honey, you know, this is what I'd be interested in doing. And we, now we have a whole context of ways that we can spank in healthy ways, in ways that are mitigating the risk of the behavior. And we, we give each, each other language that we can use to communicate things. Like if we're role playing, if I really want to be you know, the bad girl or the bad boy and, you know, then maybe I want to say no. Maybe I want to say stop. Maybe I want to say don't. And so that's why we have safe words, mm. right? And so we've created this whole context in which you can take this, this stimulus, you can get this stimulus in a way that doesn't reduce your standing in the world. It doesn't put you at physical danger and it doesn't it doesn't manipulate people un unconsensually. Yeah, it's like a whole other language and it opens up so many possibilities rather than just this monolith of this is spanking, this is one way to do it, this is choking, this is one way to do it. Like, it just makes it so much more exciting, I think. And I wish more people, you know, went out of their way to explore that because it would be so beneficial to them and... To their partners, of course. Well, and um, Maria, I mean, you mentioned uh, choking, <laughs> right? And so that was that is by far the most dangerous thing for general for the general public because you can crush the larynx, you can cause stroke, you can be choked to death, right? These are things that are mm -hmm. that are serious life ending consequences. Right. And there are safe ways to do it. You know, I mean, the safest way to do breath play. Right. So when we, we tend to describe breath play as the whole host of uh, activities. Right. So maybe that's a hand on the throat. Maybe that's something, you know, uh, you can cover the airway with your, your hand. But the safest way to do that is to say, hold your breath. Right. Because even if you pass out, you immediately begin to breathe. And that is breath play. You know, telling somebody to hold their breath is breath play. The other thing that I'll say is you absolutely do not want to squeeze the throat. You know, the, this is a common misconception that strangulation is erotic, but strangulation is what causes death, okay? There are two arteries along the, the edge of the, the neck, and you can apply light pressure to those arteries and get a head rush, and that's tends to be what people are aroused by. Mm -hmm. And so that's an example. You can, there is a safe way to practice choking, or I shouldn't say safe, that's not true. There is a safer way to practice choking, right? But if we can communicate that, instead of saying, it's bad, don't choke people, right? <laughs> instead of saying that, is we can say, hey, here are some alternatives, right? So if half the people who were doing that, who were, you know, tying a belt around mm -hmm. their neck, or actually just start holding their breath, right? Then, then we're reducing death. We're actually saving people. Mm. Yeah. Well, do you have any other tips to kind of end the episode of anyone who's looking to start exploring in the BDSM world? Like, where should they go? Obviously, your book <laughs> and find your classes. But do you have, like, simple 
easy, applicable things that people could do. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, I recommend my book. Um, you can find my book at houseofalgos.com. That's H-O-U-S-E-O-F-A-L-G-O-S dot com. And I also have my classes listed there. And the best way to do it is to engage with your local community. And if you don't have a local community, then you're not local community, right? How can people find their local community? Yeah, so the, the best way to do that is FetLife. Okay. And I know FetLife can be a source of a lot of unwanted attention for people, especially females. So the best way to do that is to start a profile without any details on it. And that's not, you're not going to get attention. So if that's an issue for you, then that's what I recommend being 99 and in Antarctica, you know, as far as your profile is concerned and use it as a networking tool, use it to find events. And the other thing that FetLife is really great for is that it, again, it's a networking tool. So if I meet somebody at a munch, which is a, like a regular gathering in a public place of kinky people, then I can be like, oh, let me look them up. And then I can say, oh, they know John. And then I can okay. call John and say, hey, John, what do you think about so-and-so, right? And that's the vetting process, right? So FetLife is a fantastic tool. If uh, I would recommend getting on FetLife, finding what events are in your area. Post-COVID, we would be, we'll be having munches, we'll be having in-person classes. And those are great opportunities to meet people in person. There are also parties that happen, depending on where you're at in the world. But parties are a great opportunity. They tend to be kind of high stress in a way, right? There's sort of this social performance anxiety thing happening. Mm. So they, you can meet people at parties. It, it's maybe better to be, your goal is to meet people at munches and classes. And then, you know, then you know some people when you get to the party. Mm. Mm. Okay. And what okay. about, do you have any advice for people that are maybe not necessarily like looking to find like people, but maybe just like actually get more into it in their own relationship or something like that? Yeah, well, yeah, classes are great. Coaching is great. I mean, myself and a lot of other BDSM professionals are willing to do one-on-one -on -one okay. couples coaching kind of thing. But also bdsmwiki.info is a great resource, especially if you're reading up online and you're, you're finding that there's a lot of words you don't understand, then that's gonna, that, that site is going to be a great resource for you to, to define mm -hmm. those words. Cool. I've never heard of either of those websites, so <laughs> this is excellent advice. Thank you. And would you like to tell people where they can find you on social media? We'll link your social media and your website down below so people can find you and your book yeah absolutely i mean i'm super consistent it's house of algos and that's again h-o-u-s-e o-f-a-l-g-o-s and that's i'm on facebook twitter instagram tiktok and my website is houseofalgos.com so that's the best way to get a hold of me cool great Sounds great. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming and spreading your wisdom and teach. I hope some beginners learn a bit more about BDSM and we kind of cleared up some misconceptions. I, I think feel we like I learned a lot of so stuff much. From yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's definitely something that we have yet to explore. So we'll check out those websites that you sent us, and we'll definitely be buying your book. Yeah. Thank you Wonderful. so much for joining. Wonderful. Us. Well, well, thank you very much, ladies. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to share my story. <laughs> cool. Thank you so much. So we hope you guys enjoyed the episode. And if you did, please make sure to share, send it to all your friends or whatever, and make sure to give us a follow on Instagram. You can also DM us there, whatever you need, whatever you want. If you have any stories, or also you can send us an email to sexwithpodcast at gmail.com or send us a message on Facebook at sexwithpodcast. Or you can even visit our website, which is www.sexwithpodcast.com and send an anonymous submission 
or secret or story, confession, anything. But yeah, you can send anonymously through there and leave us a review if you want. But other than that, we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye now. You've been listening to Sextras, presented by Honey Jane Wyatt and Maria Jose Hayodatiyi. Produced by Mabel Productions. Sex.